Right. So when you hear of the story of Robin Hood, what do you think of? Do you think of this guy? Or maybe Kevin Costner or one of those other Hollywood movies? What is the story in one sentence of Robin Hood? Bandit. Bandit. Go ahead. Steals from the bad and gives to who? The to the good. Who is the bad in the story? The rich. The rich. Who is the bad, or who's the good? The poor. The poor. That's wrong. You're, you're right. That's what you've been taught. That story has been perverted into an anti-capitalism story. But that is not the real story. I actually have a copy of the original story. The story actually goes like this. Robin Hood steals from the king who is overtaxing the people and giving it back to the people who he took it from. That is not taxing the rich and giving to the poor. That's taking from the government, a tyrannical government, something of which it does not belong to the government, and giving it back to those who it does belong to. That's the real story of Robin Hood. Now, here's the thing. Nobody really knows if this guy actually existed. There are several stories in English, are written in English, in English, uh, uh, the legal, they, when they did their court systems, it's kind of like what we do today. There's a written record of wh who was charged for what and that kind of stuff. There are several people, individuals, who resemble this story. But no historian will come down and say there is a one Robin Hood and this is this is more or less a story of, it's a moral lesson is what it is, against a tyrannical government system. But it's, it's a collection of myths and ideals. Okay? Just understand, most of your Disney movies has been perverted from, what, from the original meanings. Even The Wizard of Oz, it's not what you think it is. Um, but anyways, the, now let's see who's calling. Mr. Moffat? Okay. Mm -hmm. Would you go see Miss Kaplan, Brian? All right, the next Liberty document. It's the Magna Carta of 1215. Most classes would start with this document. But we actually don't get this document without the 1100 Chart of Liberties. This document, well, we'll get to it here in a little bit. I don't want to spill the beans just yet. But, like I said, 1100 church liberties were ignored by most of the monarchs, including Henry I. But in 1213, something came up. King John, which is known in your Robin Hood story as Little John. King John wants to appoint the bishops. Who's going to be bishops in the church? Among some other things. But the key point here is that he wants to control who's going to be in church leadership. Archbishop Stephen Langton and the Pope disputed king's, the king's position this went on for quite a while, and Stephen Langton, the archbishop, he's running a risk. He's running a risk of being executed for defying the king. But he's standing his ground. So here on this slide, the key thing for you to understand is that the 1100 church liberties were ignored by most kings. But in 1213, archbishop and the pope has a dispute over king John, with King John over the church appointments. Those are the two main points on here that you should understand. Quickly write, quickly write.
Okay, I cannot speak Latin for the life of me, but Magna Carta Liberatum, I know I'm not saying that correct. It's the Great Charter of Liberties. That's what, it's, that's what that word means, all those three words. The Great Charter of Liberties. Just understand, I, I'm not going to ask you to, to what does uh, Magna Carta Liberatum mean? I'm not going to ask you to do that on the test. Understand it, it is considered the Great Charter. There are other Magna Cartas. But the Magna Carta of 1215 is the primary one. It was signed by King John on June 15, 2015. We just passed the 800-year anniversary of it. And by the way, as you'll see in the next slide, he did not want to do this. Because what happened was the Stephen Langton, being an educated man, remembered, wait a minute, wait a minute here, don't we... Boy, it seemed like to me, we have certain rights that the king agreed to. Oh, yeah. The 1100 Church of Liberties. One of those things in here says the king is not above the law and that he is to be free from church involvement. Stephen Langton takes that to the barons and reminds them of their ancient rights. Remember, this is over 100 years since the signing of that document. Four generations. They remind the barons, you have legal rights to not only your land, <clears throat> to proper taxation, proper governance, but most importantly, for, from a theological perspective, free from government intrusion in the church. The barons take that document to the king and says, you will either uh, abide by this or we will go to war. So you'll see in this picture here, Got Stephen Langton right there in the middle in the red, red garb. You got a baron here saying, you will sign here, King John. Notice he's got his sword on. It came close to going to war, and he's not happy about it, is he? This is an actual painting of that time period. This is the actual document, by the way. They have it. And there's, I think they made four copies, uh, hand copies, and this is wax, by the way. Um, it's like a wax seal, but uh, you can go to Great Britain to, the, to their National Museum there and see it. Um, it is like our Constitution. It is under, uh, I don't even know if a nuclear bomb could blow it out of its container. It's, it's very well sealed, and it goes down into a vault each night when they close like our Constitution does. So, very important document. But he reminded the barons, you have ancient rights, assert them. You're not creating something new. You're not even being disrespectful to the king. These are yours. And the barons said, oh my gosh, that's right. We forgot about these. So they signed the Magna Carta. What's in the Magna Carta? Well, first of all, understand the significance of the Magna Carta. I'll write that in your notes. The significance of the Magna Carta is that most constitutions today are based on this document. Most constitutions in the world is based on this document. And it has its provisions, the roots of its provisions, start in the, in the 1100 Chart of Liberties. Are you seeing dots being connected here? Now, we haven't got into the provisions of the Magna Carta yet. But you should start seeing some dots starting. We've got about two or three dots now on paper that you should be able to start drawing lines to. So, the, if I ask you on the test, what is the, what is the significance of the Magna Carta? The significance is of the Magna Carta, and I'm in a complete sense, the, the significance of the Magna Carta 1215 is most constitutions in the world today are based on it. That is the significance. Now, I would hope you would extend on that and then draw into our own constitution as, we, as you learn more about it today. But that is the first, and the, that's your thesis statement right there. I would expect you to tell me how it's connected to the 1100 Charter of Liberties. The three primary things we still get from this document today, oh, by the way, let me back up. One of the first statements in the Magna Carta reasserts all of the rights in the 1100 Charter of Liberties. So the Magna Carta does not stand alone. It says, in addition to the 11, and I'm paraphrasing, in addition to all the rights and liberties 
asserted in the 1100 Charter of Liberties, the following also apply. And the three that we care about today is parliamentary government. For the first time, we have representative government. So when you hear the word parliamentary government, that is the same thing as representative government. We don't use representative government at this time frame yet. It's called parliamentary government. But for the first time in English law, we have parliamentary government, representative government. We also, for the first time, have taxation through representation, which comes through parliamentary government. And we also have due process rights. You cannot just throw somebody in prison now. That individual now has a right to challenge that incarceration. He has a right to know why he's in, uh, why he's in prison. And he has a right to a trial. Due process. All of these things that we have today, we enjoy these things. In fact, you want to have a civil war in this country? Deprive some of these. Oh, wait a minute. That happened in 1776. We have these today because of this document. Now, we're going to talk about natural law soon. So it's actually encompassed. That's why we go back to the Ten Commandments in, in, in a normal class, because all of this is wrapped up into our humanity. We'll talk about that, at least when we get to the Bill of Rights. 